the State of Survival podcast, bringing you survival game news. Hello folks, and welcome to the State of Survival podcast. Today we are going to be having our first ever second guest onto the show today. Today we are happy and pleased to have our Hokiana onto the podcast. Hokiana has quite an impressive and well-earned reputation. Not only a Daisy modding community, but as well as a streamer, content creator, and once a server and owner, and now days a server owner once again. But that's not all. She also is a coder by trade, and even took her own stab at making her own game in Unreal. A quite impressive efforts and results, often during her stream, showcasing her amazing work. She recently got hired as a game developer herself, so let's go ahead and chat with her and find out more. So, hello, hello, Kiana. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Thank you uh, for coming on to the State of Survival podcast. We are really happy to have you here with my fellow host, Yarla Goats, and our in the background producer, Red Falcon. Oh, thank right. you for having me here. Definitely, definitely. Have you ever uh, been, um, had the pleasure of meeting my fellow host, Jarl of Goats? Uh, not before today. Oh, nice, nice. What about you, Jarl? Have you ever had a chance to actually experience or see Hokiana streaming before? Um, I did not until that you mentioned that she was going to be our guest. Joined the Discord, started playing on the server that she runs for DayZ, and uh, went back and watched a bunch of VODs. And I love the fact that we get to see the perspective of playing DayZ, but also the perspective of coding for DayZ as well. I think that's really refreshing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Helkiana, it, it's such an interesting name. I think when I first tried to read your name, I butchered it like a hundred times. I think it was only after like somebody like sat me down and was all like, no, it's Helkiana. <laughs> <laughs> Where I actually heard you say it officially uh, that got me to pr properly pronounce it. But uh, what is the background of your name? Like, uh, why do you call yourself Helkiana? Um, to be honest, uh, I used to have a different name uh as my streamer name um but i really wanted something more unique uh, i used to be called flowbot um that nickname came from the fact that my colleagues thought i was a robot uh because <laughs> i knew every answer for coding um so they called me flowbot flow for that's my my name and uh when uh, when I was playing games and people come in my stream, they kept uh, thinking that my name was related to the Floybots band, uh, which was not. I never ever heard of them before <laughs> uh, until people started telling me about it. So I went on this website and I started like generating names. I was like, I want something, and I'll Google it, and if there's nothing with it and it sounds nice, then I'll stick with it. <laughs> I visited those that name generators awesome. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is awesome. That is awesome. Man, they, they thought you were a, ro a, a robot, huh? Just like just a machine. You just busted things out. Yeah, they were asking me questions when they had the issues. They were like, hey, this thing uh, is like error. Uh, what is wrong with it? And I'm like, go to this line 41 in this script at this location <laughs> and uh, see what that says. And uh, you'll find your issue. <laughs> Have you read the comments oh. in the code? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that is awesome. That is awesome. So you were like the in-house, you know, uh, AI for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> basically they but they were pretty like... yeah and they were pretty amazed because i was uh, i was basically a junior and i just came out of university by already new programming and all that and uh they weren't expecting that and i was just working side by side with seniors from the very beginning you know it's very very nice no that's really cool to hear about because you know it's always interesting to hear about how people got names because like my name has a weird story Jarl's name, I think, mainly came from what was it again, Jarl? Something about not uh, wanting to I made, anymore. I made a joke name, uh, heralding my Irish and Scottish heritage, and YouTube said no, <laughs> so I changed it. 
<laughs> but you know, it, it's cool to hear about that because it really kind of like is your identity as a online presence. You know, whether it's your modding or streaming, any other kind of thing that you do when you engage with these communities, it's always cool to hear about the backstory behind the name and why you stuck with it for so long. Have you ever thought about changing it, or are you just rock solid? You like Helkiana? Um, I think I kind of like it now. It became a brand as well, like a lot in the community as well, and I don't think I can change it again. <laughs> stuck with it. Um, but you know, it's kind of funny finally getting to sit here, um, sit down and talk with you. I, as a fellow modder of DayZ, have actually heard a lot about you over the course of the, gosh, it's almost four and a half years I've been modding for the DayZ community. And uh, we even had the pleasure of you uh, coming and playing on the new Dawn when that server was up and running with us for a little bit. Um, but like, it's always been kind of like, like you were the person that some of the modders aspired to be. Not only just recognition, but like, I think there was a rumor going around that BI offered you a job and stuff like that. Again, it was, we, we, it was 100% confirmed, but it was just so cool as a, somebody who was part of the modding community to hear about somebody like you who was not only well recognized because of your mods, but the fact that your mods were recognized because of the good work you put into them. Um, so it's awesome to have you here. Thanks. Um, I think a lot of people do look up to some some of the bigger mothers, you know, but we're just people. So don't think that we're like these geniuses. We all struggle when we make the mods and sometimes we spend hours like on this stupid thing that we just didn't see it. And then it's just like, oh, oh, OK, there was this this one line that, you know, wasn't supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> so we all go through the same trials. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you're, 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 you're not a, a flow bot anymore. You're Hell Keon, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's oh, awesome. interesting, too, because I, I don't create mods for games, but I'm really big into modding games. And even when I'm doing Bethesda titles, there are some modders that I won't hear from for a while. I'm like, man, I really like their content and the stability of their mods. Where are they at? And it's such a weird parasocial kind of connection to make with your favorite modders because it's true. You guys are just normal people like everybody else. But the difference is you're pouring your passion and your time and your energy into something for other people to enjoy, even possibly breathe new light into a product. And uh, it's, it's a very selfless thing. It might be a hobby, but a lot of us who don't write mods absolutely respect the work that gets put into it. Yeah, Thank definitely, you. definitely. And, you know, it, it's interesting because, like, kind of tell us about your story. Like, kind of like what has gotten you from where you started to where you are right now? Um, I guess I, I've, I've been a programmer for many years. I've enjoyed coding since very, very young. Um, but I tried modding initially in Arc Survival Evolved. But when I looked at the blueprints, they were really, really scary. I made one tiny mod. They were like, it was changing the starting gear when he would spawn uh, in Ark. That's it. That was my first very mod, but it was really shit. <laughs> it was in incompatible with everything. And I ended up like losing the files because uh, of the reset of the computer and all that as well. And, you know, but then... Um, I uh, I started playing DayZ and I I didn't really enjoy PvP. I thought it was a really bad battle royale game. <laughs> so I was like, I I don't know. I feel like I could like this game, but not this way. So I played on some PvE servers. Uh, I found out there are some PvE servers, and uh, I fell in love with it. Um, but there was a lot of missing stuff. Like, I feel like there could be more, like, for PvE players to do, to, like, decorate your bases and stuff like that. And, uh, I kept re uh, recommending uh, mods that I could find on the, uh, the Steam Workshop, and the owners kept refusing them. And I, I didn't really understand them why. Like, they weren't really going into depth. Probably, you know, 
now I understand why, because <laughs> it can be a little bit hard when you get like thousands and thousands of recommendations and opinions from your players, and you have to like explain again and again and again and again why this thing doesn't work, and you know. But curiosity got me, and I was like, okay, let me let me have a look. Well, what do these mods do? And uh, when I looked at the programming language, uh, I was like, it's, it's not, it's not that different from C sharp, uh, which was my full time job. And uh, I looked into some of the current mods to see what they do, and I, was, I saw a lot of bad behaviors in coding, uh, like repeating themselves and copying code that wasn't needed and I was like oh, I just um, trying to make those better um, and uh, I think um, my stuff back kind of grew quite a bit <laughs> because of that because uh, I standardized a lot of things people even now I find like a lot of mods have copied the code uh, yeah. like in my stuff pack which uh, I was okay with. I always told people, you know, like, it's it's not like an invention, you know, like, I, I don't want them to to just look there and learn why I did it that way. You know, don't just take the code, just learn why it was made that way, and then you can use it for your own mod. But yeah, um, as I was making mods, I was really enjoying creating content for um, people. Uh, my my job was in finance and we didn't really have like an end client uh so i was coding but didn't really have much feedback of what i was doing um but modding was giving me that kind of i don't know uh satisfaction yeah uh ah. and uh i i thought about moving into games industry uh for a while uh, but I knew it was going to be hard because um, they might not recognize my experience uh, as something useful for games. Mm -hmm. um, and also it was going to be hard with the salary because games developers get paid a lot, lot less than developers in finance. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, our company did a restructure and I got let go into like from from this I had the choice to like reapply and stuff but they were gonna pay me some big bucks to leave and I was like eh, why not I will take the money <laughs> 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 um, and uh, I thought you know maybe this is the sign maybe this is the time to start looking at games I had three months to find a new job and said I'll give it two months to find the games job if not, then I'll, I'll go back to finance and, and look there, you know. Um, I was very confident I'll find in finance, but like, uh, in games was a bit Pretty different. Ample. Yeah. Um, nice. And uh, I did apply to Bohemia as well, as a scripter, but they gave me a junior salary and I wasn't going to accept that. Uh, okay. Because they also wanted me to relocate to um, uh, Prague. The Czech Republic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, while the salaries would have been okay for someone early in their 20s, you know, just out of uni, it wasn't going to be okay for me anymore. I am also supporting mm -hmm. my parents uh, with money. And when I calculated how much it would be, I wouldn't have money for food. <laughs> okay. So, um, it was kind of sad because, like, it was a dream to work on Daisy and like help um, make new survival features, you know. But um, I got hired by a company in UK with uh, an okay salary, like not the best, but like still way better <laughs> than what I was offered on Daisy. And it was a, what they call a co-dev company. So they take projects from other studios 
and they help them uh, finish them like and do certain features uh, or maybe like certain projects are just like ports to consoles because uh, they don't have the time to do, the, do it themselves. Um, and actually just recently I got a new job in August, uh, but this one is at uh, an indie studio. Oh. Uh, they're making their own uh, game, which is no announced, so I can't really talk about it, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> no race. No race. Well, I, I'm I'm really glad to hear all of that. That sounds like such an interesting journey. Uh, you know, right out of uh, college or uni, going into financial, uh, doing C sharp coding and that kind of stuff, and then you know trying to improve a game that you were loving playing, and suggesting mods to, you know, even looking at how to make mods yourself because you were so curious. Uh, then all the way till now, going into a uh, another game dev position since you already had one before as a uh, indie game dev uh, alongside them, and it's kind of interesting. It's a hush hush situation. But I'm also <laughs> not very interest. I'm not very well versed in that uh, industry. So for me, it's all like, "Ooh, what you're working on?" Um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> but no, it, it's it's really cool, and it's nice that you uh, kind of talked about uh, that you were offered a job by BI and DayZ. I will actually, you know, I talked a little bit about how it's really awesome to talk to you because just to tell you folks who are watching this, Helkiana is one of the few original modders who actually made quality or good mod packs. A lot of mods back in the day uh, were just retextures and very, very shoddy work uh, back then. And Helkiana, Mass, a couple of other people really kind of paved the way forward for a lot of us modders um, and kind of showed us what can be done with uh, the Daisy engine being a you know virtual reality and oh reality virtual or something in infusion hybrid but you know it's cool to hear about all this Hokiana, because you're still here you're still modding for day z your much stuff pack and some of your other mods are still some of the most highly subscribed and well sought after mods on the workshop i don't think there are many servers out there that i know of that don't have one of your mods or mod that you've helped collaborate on um, that's not part of the server pack. It's pretty impressive, uh, to be honest. Yeah, thank you. To be honest, I have, I have used that as a, a point to try and get a game job. <laughs> I was like, look <laughs> at this mod I made. It has almost 2 million subscribers. I am good at what I do. Please hire me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, though, that's really smart, too, because a lot of times with modding, you have communities, you have people who like mods, people who comment on them. Uh, and it's easy when, when you're a player and you're looking for a mod to a single player game or when you're trying to run a server with somebody, you go, wow, this mod looks really interesting. And then you just kind of see the community communication between the community and the modder it gives you an idea of the quality before you even try it which i always say still try it anyway because sometimes communities can be rough but it's nice because it's like you have an audience that are saying this is great oh yeah uh, uh, um to be honest that's kind of the, one of the reasons why i kind of got into uh my modding uh, as well is because I kind of wanted to do this more as a profession. So, you know, total respect to you, Helkiana, doing that and being able to use it as part of your portfolio or uh, stuff to present to um, the game industries and you actually possibly helping you get a job, whether how small it was, it's still cool to hear about. However, you have worn many hats from being a person who was once a player, to a server owner, to a content creator, doing your own streams, making your own mods, to even game development of your own in the Unreal Engine. What is, out of all of those hats, uh, which one would you like to talk about right now? Would you like to uh, talk about your uh, streaming, your modding a little bit more, or would you like to talk about a little bit about your game dev? Uh, I think uh, talking a little bit about the game dev, uh, haven't really gone too much into that uh, so far. Um, yeah, if that's okay. definitely. Yep. No, yep. I'm totally I'm okay with that. I love that. Uh, you know, you just wear so many hats. I just wanted to make sure we we're going in the right direction. Um, so 
Um, I asked a couple of questions about, uh, you know, what made you start wanting to start to making your own game. Was it kind of like what you're saying with the whole Daisy kind of workshop stuff? You were able to present it to people, or are there other inspirations behind it? Um, to be honest, I do have a big dream. I have I have a dream to make a better Daisy, basically. <laughs> but the Daisy killer. Also, yes, the Daisy killer. Um, but obviously that is a massive, massive dream, and it's not something I will achieve by myself. But I wanted to say, what can I do to kind of get there and also make use of it um, to improve my skills for my current job, right? So I, as you most know, programmers tend to have a massive imposter syndrome. <laughs> so even though I'm like confident in my skills, I always, I always doubt that if I am performing like as I should. Um, so I decided to like just make a game, uh, it's still a survival game because otherwise I wouldn't have the interest into like working on it. Um, and this would help me improve my game, my, my game development skills in Unreal Engine and it will help my job, you know, it'll help me get maybe new jobs, um, at some point because you can never really talk about what you've been working on on the job. <laughs> Even in interviews, you got to be careful about what you say. Um, so it's tough to, to have a portfolio um, in, in the games industry um, because the, game, the games you work on most of the time might not even release or might be five to seven years until they release. So you won't have credits for a very long time. So you got to work outside. To, to build up portfolio. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So, what game engine did you settle on? We have Unity, Unreal. I know there's a bunch of other game engines out there. So, when you decided to make this survival game, uh, which engine did you decide to use? Um. Well, to be honest, actually, like first time I tried, I tried Unity. I made like I followed this like tutorial how to make a survival game. Uh, it was kind of cool uh, because I was doing C sharp before. Unity is also C sharp, uh, so it's an easy transition. But then when I looked at the industry, um, it's using a lot more C plus plus, which is Unreal Engine, uh, and it, all the in-house engines they use C plus plus. Um, so I was like, you know, I will just go for Unreal Engine then, and I'll specialize on this. Um, so I worked a little bit on Unreal Engine 4, uh, and then like Unreal Engine 5 came out, so I've been on that, uh, ever since. Nice, nice. So, uh, what kind of survival game did you choose to make in Unreal? Like, what kind of were you going for? Were you going for like a, you know, uh, like a island survival, kind of like DayZ? I know you said you wanted to make a, you know, better DayZ, but you know, there can be plenty of environments Daisy would thrive in. What kind of one did you decide to go with? Um, so it, it is a single player story driven game. Uh, it is set in like uh, British Columbia uh, in the mountains. Um, I'm, I'm, I really love that environment with the, with the mountains and the forest and like big lakes and, and rivers, you know, and the nature. I love nature. Um, and I, I was thinking of making a like a prologue. Uh, so it will be a short story about five hours or like if you do the main story, but I wanted to make it so after you finish the story, you can like keep going around and like loot more, fight some more enemies. Uh, th things will respawn, kind of like how Daisy works. Um. I do, I do like that. And you know, it was uh, very generous of you. You were able to provide us quite a few awesome uh, images of your work in the Unreal Engine. Uh, I think right now we have one of your biome images, um, um, things up. Can you tell us about like the biomes and stuff that you created in the Unreal Engine and how like? kind of you felt about that 
Um, yeah, so there was a lot of research that I had to, to do on like what kind of trees live, you know, on what side and stuff. And like, I, I was going with Google uh, camera, <laughs> uh, trying to, to find uh, different references and stuff, because I, I don't know what, what kind of trees grow where. And um, I, uh, so I had like an idea of like a couple points of interest as well. So you have your main area, which is the bunker, your hideout, kind of like Tarkov style. But without the screen, you, you you walk into it and and you go there. You and you're gonna have like some um, some storages and crafting tables and stuff. And then you have like in this picture, there's like a, a radio tower uh, that mm -hmm. is kind of forcing you. The way I wanted to make the environment is forcing you to go up there, um, so you scout from a higher point. Uh, of where you need to go next. Um, this one is the the quarry. Um, so there's a mine nearby, and uh, it's pretty common to have coal uh, coal quarries uh, in that area. Uh, so it's just like a remnant of of the old industry. This is basically where they made their money. Ah, <laughs> oh, so it's like an abandoned coal factory, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's and I cool. like the I like the attention to detail here because when you're looking at this whole coal plant, uh, you're not just putting random equipment or random buildings. It looks like there was once life there; that it was once an operational mill, which is really awesome. I do have to put yeah. a bit of a disclaimer there. I I'm not a level designer, so a lot of these I I like I take from uh projects uh that i find on on the marketplace uh but then i add my own little thing to it so like this one was set up like this um and then um the ground i made it look like um like it, it's uh you know the dirt from the coal like settled in the area kind of thing oh um, yeah that's cool but that's such so a cool way did... to use it too, because if you work with Unreal Engine, that's kind of the the discipline that you have to teach yourself is you don't have to create all your assets by scratch. And it's really awesome seeing people incorporate assets that you can find on the Unreal Marketplace and other, other marketplaces where you can incorporate them for your purpose, but still change them to become your own kind of image, which is really neat. No, and it, it's nice too. It's kind of interesting. You did mention that uh, you're not a level designer, and that some of these are actually from uh, the Unreal like marketplace, I think. Yeah. Or what? So how how is uh, that? How how easy is it to take something like from the marketplace and put it into your game? Was it difficult? Uh, it's uh, it's not difficult at all. Unreal Engine makes it very easy. Um, but it is expensive. So mm. I invested a lot of money into buying some of these more high quality stuff because you can find cheap stuff, but it won't be it won't be good quality. Um, and, and you end up like spending time trying to fix the models or textures and stuff like that. And I have bought a lot of stuff that was bad and I ended up not being able to use it. And there's no refund part because like you can't say, oh, the quality is not up. Right. to you know yeah. to the bar um and uh yeah so that was a lot of wasted money but it's an investment that i want to make and um it would be still be cheaper than hir hiring an artist to make everything um oh, I bet. for this for this map uh that you see in the picture is a four by four um kilometer map zero uh made the terrain for me initially so i just drew him in paint and i was like i want a river here and i want a river there and i want like these mountains here and <laughs> and uh and then he he made like uh most of it because i don't know how to how to do it myself obviously i could look up tutorials and stuff like that but i would just waste a lot of time trying to do that as well um so he helped me out um at the beginning um 
I think uh, I did do on stream once a walk from the hideout to where the main story leads you to. It's which is like a an observatory with like an underground lab. Uh, mm. and that's where your final goal is to obtain an item there. Um, and it took, uh, I think, about 25 minutes to walk uh, from one side to another, but that's without any other obstacles like food requirement, the weather, yeah. enemies, and stuff like that. Right, just, just a bird straight flies kind of situation. Yeah. No, so I thought really that cool. was, really was cool. good, good, you know, for a small game just for someone to explore a little bit. Nice. Now, you did mention someone there, Zero. Who's Zero? Uh, Zeroi. Uh, he's uh, another mother. Uh, he made the Zeroi fishing and he had like, I don't know, some Jeep mod at some point. Uh, cool. Yeah, so he's uh, he's also doing some Unreal Engine work. Uh, I think in, in his free time mostly as a contractor. Uh, he has a full full time job, I think, in IT. Um, but he, he likes to do like level design. Yeah, and honestly, I think my favorite part about this image here, as somebody who lives in the mountains in an area very similar to this, it's always refreshing to see careful attention done to snow fl flow and how it kind of scatters on a mountain, how it dresses a mountain. I've played too many survival games where it's you know, temperate forest, temperate forest, temperate forest, and then just a wall of snow. And now you're in the mountains. Um, I've only seen in a lot of professional titles that done really well in Red Dead Redemption 2. So it's nice to see this kind of attention to the biome and the, and the geography and how the weather would react to it in an amateur game, which is really nice. No, that's, that's really yeah. nice too. And oh, go ahead. Um, well, that's one thing, uh, like. I really wanted to work on is on altitude um so it's uh changing the weather depending on the altitude and the 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 warmth as well like uh, well i guess colder it gets colder as you go up on the mountain where it's snow by default nice but it's gonna be it's gonna be a while <laughs> until i get that working <laughs> Oh, we, we got, we got, um, yeah. Yeah, Lieutenant General Zombie says, Damn dump, been playing VR DayZ with a haptic suit on. That's one hell of a shiner. <laughs> yeah, dump, what what happened, buddy? <laughs> uh, so, folks, it, it, it's not a shiner, although it would be fun to play it off as. I got kind of ambitious, and I'm all like, you know what? It's October, and we're only going to be doing two podcasts in October, so... Why not dress up for Halloween kind of October stuff? So <laughs> I epically failed, by the way. I was supposed to look like a deco half decomposing corpse, but I look like either somebody gave me a shiner or I am a very badly painted on clown face. Um, <laughs> so well, I think since everybody thinks you're injured, you definitely nailed it. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Moving back to... Uh, Away from my botched off makeup, don't look at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and look at some of the other photos that you provided us about your game because you didn't just make a pretty landscape. You actually went further in depth with this too. Uh, yeah, so I worked on a couple mechanics, obviously the the whole like health and water and, and food system. Um, they were pretty basic. Um, you know, they, they drain over time and then you can eat something and it just gives you some food i didn't go any further so far because um i like to work in iterations so i implement a basic one and then go over and make it a bit more complicated later on uh because it's very easy to get stuck in the complexity and the design of such features like trying to I don't know, get food poisoning and stuff like that and like all of these things. And it's just like, oh, how do I connect them all? How do I make it all, you know? <laughs> um, so one of the mechanics uh, that I wanted to have is to make a purpose of the hideout base. And um, 
you can uh, construct like different benches. So you go and find items uh, in in the outside world, and then you bring them back to your base, and then you can construct like uh, a weapon tuning bench, for example, or uh, something similar, um, where you could do some some more special stuff. Um, this was just an example of the UI, how it would show, you know, the requirements, time, and if there is like a cost of currency, and then just press construct and then you would have to wait for it to, to finish constructing. Um, I got a hint to would... you. My, my favorite thing about this too is the ghost, the construction ghost. A lot of times when games do it, it's too bright, hard to see where it lines up. And I love how it shows all the detail of the workbench, but still makes it to where you can see how you're lining it up and still see the ghost really well. Uh, I think that's some of the best ghosting I've seen. And I was even impressed with Medieval Dynasty's construction ghosting. It's really, really good. <laughs> yeah, I uh, my eyes struggle with a lot of bright stuff uh, because I spent, like, I don't know, 16 hours a day in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. So I always uh, try to, like, make things, like, less bright in, in, in the game. <laughs> Which is um, nice. If, if anybody has an HDR monitor, they know that pain. Especially since, you know, this is a bunker, so it's relatively dark down there. And then to have something really bright in front of you, it's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, man, I, uh, I absolutely love the clutter. Oh, go ahead. Uh, look, looks like uh, we got a message from Lieutenant Jen Zombie. Has anyone asked what Hulk Fiona uses to mod? Like the Steam Workshop editor or the standalone editor? Or the full on or full on blender. Well, uh, what do you use? Uh, this is a tough question. <laughs> this is, I guess, <laughs> neither of those and all of those uh, at the same time. Um, so I do use Blender sometimes. I'm not an artist, but I do have to modify some models sometimes um, to make them fit for Daisy to be lower poly or um, just like. I sometimes remove bits from models because I feel like they're, they're not needed anymore. Um, and uh, I have tried to make my own models as well and use Substance paint Painter to make the the textures as well. Didn't didn't come the best, you know, but like, it was a try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I use uh, Visual Studio Code to do the coding. Um, there's basically no help there from the IDE. That's why we call these uh, like IDE. Um, and uh, it's a lot of searching in the code. Just search in the, the vanilla code. Uh, see how they do it, find examples. Sometimes I even have a, a lot of other mods unpacked uh, when I have to like modify their stuff, um, hmm. which I do a lot for Willow Glade. And uh, I use PBO project to pack. Um, it is the better um, version than Atom Builder. <laughs> Even though I hate a lot of stuff about PBO project, this, it's also still better than Atom Builder. So I, like, there's no choice there. And uh, I to test, <laughs> 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 and to test uh, I use the Diag mode um, on my local machine. Nice. Well, I think and we just got another comment. Yeah, what we'll makes you prefer VS Code over Studio? Um, because the Studio is for a full-on solution, whereas the like Daisy doesn't have a full project, and it has its own language as well. Visual Studio Code deals with it a little bit better, and it doesn't like throw me. Errors. I do have squiggly lines all over the place telling me this thing is this is not correct syntax. And I'm like, I know, because they have their own stupid language <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> oh man, that is awesome. That is awesome. Uh but before we move on, add on breaker all the way. Uh I'm just kidding. <laughs> um but seriously. Uh but you know, it's cool going back to your workbenches. I actually have worked on my own workbenches in real life. Like, you know, I fix my own cars. I'm a very handy person. And 
the amount of clutter and kind of or- disorganization on that workbench kind of fits kind of what my workbench mm-hmm. looks like. <laughs> so props on that. Uh, it, it's nice to see. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, what you call organized chaos. I know where it is, but if you came to my bench, you can find a damn thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm the, I'm the same. Um, yeah, I did like, uh, you know, having the, the hologram, the, the ghost thingy, like having it clean but then like when it's finished it like looks like it's been used a little bit um but there's always um, a little bit of a problem with with that with players because they look at the items on the bench and they're like oh why can i not pick up this thing you know why can i not take this thing that is on the bench right here (laughs) to to use it like if you have a wrench or some wd you know um and uh, it's very hard to make that clear to the players that it's not something to be used and it's just for the looks. Even, even with my experience in debugging and such, I still caught myself the other day in Starfield needing a med kit and seeing their like little pharmaceutical bench. I was like, oh, there's one. Oh, no, that's actually part of the model. <laughs> Nuts! <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, looks like we have another message from Iceblade. Uh, why not use Daisy Tools Workbench itself? I had to get itself. Because kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do use it sometimes uh, when when I really get stuck, um, like in debugging. Um, I use mm-hmm. that. But also the Workbench crashes a lot and you end up like losing uh like some work wow. and start startup time is 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 very very slow and yeah. visual studio code yeah, but sorry to jump in i was going to say yeah my answer to that is cuz it sucks <laughs> um, and, we agree there and High and five. the i can get the same kind of breakpoint functionality just use throwing print statements in <laughs> Um, to, to, to a degree, yeah, it works. Um, but I use it for debugging sometimes, uh, especially when I need to test between client and server code. That's where it comes in best. I, I kind of understand that perspective too, because I do a lot of animation work, and I use I used to use Unreal uh, Engine and um, 3ds Studio Max for a lot of my stuff. Cinema 4D sometimes. Uh, and I'm still sitting here trying to figure out Blender. For some reason, I just can't, my brain can't wrap around it. And I don't know why. It's the same concepts, but I'm like, oh, I didn't used to have to do it this way. This, And I notice that a lot with software. People go, well, why don't you just use Blender? You could learn it on your own. It's it's because it's not what I'm comfortable with. And I just, I think it sucks, even though there's people out there that, that love it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, definitely. It can be very hard to to learn um i i learned, only learned a couple things how to do in, in in blender and sometimes i had someone tell me about three four times hey how do i how do i do this thing again i <laughs> i just i can't find it it's like it's not intuitive and the worst thing is the undo uh, steps keeps resetting in blender yeah, I was working on a donut project for Dump to see if I could learn Blender, and my sprinkles were five stories tall, and I couldn't figure out why I messed that up. And I was just like, <laughs> "Oh, Blender's not that bad, folks." <laughs> it's not. No, it's not. It, it's an example of somebody who's learned on a completely different interface. It's probably more difficult. And my technique was learned in a more difficult system. So when I get something that's a little easier to work with, I'm like, I don't have to do this to get it working properly. I hate it. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely feel that with a lot of Daisy stuff, moving on to more streamlined approaches to building mods. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer punching myself in the gut anymore. I'm all like, but why not do that? I don't know, whatever. But let's go ahead and go back to your actual game development. Um, you gave us even more photos. Uh, we're going to keep going through the photos, folks, because uh, you showed us some crafting stuff um, from the bench itself, I think. Uh, yeah, so I wrote the system on how the crafting uh, benches would work and adding recipes to them. I have like some placeholder icons there 
Um, and I just wanted to work more on the UI um, to kind of make it clear um, and easy for players to craft one or more or max buttons there. Um, so a lot of games like actually I was playing today um, in Shrouded and then Ooh, you had to spam uh, you had to spam the craft button space and, and to be like I want I want 10 string and then they were like spamming the damn button and making the sound every time it was so annoying mm. <laughs> you know I mean I, life I totally feel you on that, that. I had to do that with the yeah. string too. I'm like, da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's why I wanted to like work more on these quality of life features and of all the things that frustrate me in games that have crafting and and uh, I think uh, it worked out pretty well. I added the, like it was a bit confusing for some people when they saw the queue. It's just more like it's the progress. You can only do one item at a time. Um, compared to like an actual queue like Icarus where you can queue up like different recipes one after another. Um, I said for now it's okay um, and then later on I will decide as a design when I add more items and more recipes like true recipes. These were just some examples you know like make some planks from wood logs. Um, yeah. it, I didn't really have the real scenarios to be able to say Yes, we want to be able to like let the player just queue them up and they can go on and do other stuff or they should be waiting on this bit more uh, that can be part um, of the gameplay loop itself, you know, having to stay around your base a bit more. So oh, yeah, that's a decision yeah. later on. I, I like that. I like quality of life situations where it's not necessarily automating. You still have to gather the resources. You still have to do all that, but it's still interesting enough. Um, what's going on here? It looks like you're interacting with a blocker. Uh, yeah. So I guess like, um, kind of how I was making the lockers in uh, in Daisy a little bit, like where you have to open them to see the inventory. Um, in this one, you go up to the locker and you press F and it will open the door. Um, and then you'll get the option um, to uh, either close it or like look inside the locker to see the um, the, the inventory. Um, I was trying to work on this type of menu that is dynamic. Uh, it was very difficult. It took me a lot of tries to get it working uh, to switch, you know, from just one to multiple, depending on the state. Um, and that third picture is just like the um, uh, the showing that you can pick up the stick. Um, I was trying to figure out how do you communicate to the player of the different actions that they can do, whereas the one with the stick, it has like a hand, so it kind of says, this is a pickup action. Whereas the one at the locker has like a door uh, icon, which means it's like you interact with the door. Um, but to be honest, like since, since I've done this, I've created two more interaction systems at work. Uh, and I've learned a lot since then on how to do it better. So I want to I wanna go back and redo it and make it better. Um, more performant as well. Very nice. Um, so for this one, it just shows basically the vicinity. I really like in Daisy that you have vic vicinity. I hate in Tarkov that you do not have a vicinity. And you know when like you drop some stuff on a next like on a body, and then it's just gone underneath the the scab's leg, and you can't find the one thing that you were like, oh shit, I dropped it by mistake. I need the bag and now it's gone because like you can't actually see it, you know. Uh where yeah. whereas in Daisy, if you drop something, then you just look in vicinity and it's just like, oh yeah, here it is. Uh yeah, it makes I, it a bit faster as well. I have to agree. I like the vicinity and window in Daisy, because a lot of games handle the vicinity in different ways. You know, you see people where like it does like a pulse scan or 
you know, you hold a button and it highlights the objects in the area. But you still have to, like, look at them and pick them up, which, don't get me wrong, is completely immersive and maybe sometimes more fun. But I also feel like sometimes it can be extremely tedious, where the vicinity from DayZ, I always felt like a, your character is actually, like, looking around, and that's how they're able to see the items. And like you said, with Tarkov and, you know, things going underneath people, it's really cool that the vicinity in DayZ kind of negates that, like, you know, uh, the view geometry blocker kind of situation that we used to yeah. have in DayZ, but I'm pretty sure in Tarkov it may not be exactly that name. Yeah, yeah, it can be very frustrating as a player, um, but I have noticed, like, the issues in programming it. Um, it can get very complex um, in, in trying to block uh, things that are not in view as well. You know, so you don't loot things behind the wall and stuff like that. And like finding that fine balance of what blocks your view and what doesn't, it's it's pretty difficult. So I, I can I can see why a lot of games don't do it. Um I guess another thing on like because like we still have the inventory. I chose to go with a single slot inventory. Um I have done a jigsaw uh inventory once in Unreal, like the Daisy one. Uh, but it proved very complex. <laughs> like I've done it, but there were a lot of like things that they weren't working a hundred percent. And um, I said for this scope for a game that is just a couple hours of gameplay, there's no point in putting that much time in trying to perfect the system when I could just use the the single slot, which is um, a lot simpler. So this one, I know it's like, it's kind of small, so you can, maybe you can't really see it, but you may recognize the layout. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's I basically I copied a the daisy. Yeah, I copied the daisy XMLs set up uh, for spawning loot. So this was where the <laughs> loot spawning in, in houses. Um, and then I have one, which is basically the types which says, like, spawn in, in this category, and uh, it, it does, like, same thing that CE does, um, where he scans mm -hmm. uh, for the houses um, and the loot points, and it, like, stores the, those points and with the categories attached to them. Uh -huh. And then um, it checks, you know, nominal, and if we have that much in the world and stuff like that, and it will respawn them. Uh, periodically and you can put them how often it should respawn um kind of uh, like this one you know like no i thought it so it's kind of <laughs> kind of like the daisy system are these full items that spawn in the house like that you have to pick up or is it like you search for these items and the container has these much items so like it's kind of like a hybrid of like a search or is it purely kind of like daisy in that situation where the items just spawn um, in the house it has both actually. Um, so there are items that spawn in the houses, uh, just like in Daisy, in like specific points. But there are containers as well, uh, which will, on search, uh, it will check the CE to see if we can spawn more of those. So that's one thing that Daisy, we don't really have much access when we do these mods um, with containers that you search, you cannot check against CE that easily. Uh, if we're yeah. at max nominal and if we should spawn more or not uh, whereas my system obviously I had more control over it uh, so I made this so it checks the economy to make sure that we're not overpopulating with the one item I like it I like it Yeah, I mean, y'all, that's pretty cool, right? Like, that the container spawn uh, RNG are, checks the, 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 loot, the loot economy that already exists to give you the items. So, like, it just doesn't uh, destroy the loot economy based off searchables. Yeah, I do like that a lot, especially if you have certain weapons or armors that you want to be more rare than others or even medicines. Uh, it can really help the fact that it checks the library and make sure that there's not too many of them. So what do we have here, Kalkiana? It looks like uh, some sort of mission log. 
Uh, yeah, so I implemented a mission system. I feel like a lot of games, like survival games, don't have anything. They're like, go and survive. And then you're like, so what am I supposed to do? Like, okay, I go punch a tree, but what now? <laughs> you know? Um, so I think uh, having uh, like a, a main story um, that kind of guides the player through the environment a little bit. Um, and also, like, it rewards the player with certain items. It can really balance things up. Um, and I made this so you can have the main quest, you know, when you start the game first time, that's your your main one. You follow the story. But then you have, like, side stuff that you get from your hideout. Um, those are just some examples. Like, I typed up some like examples to have something to display in the in the UI um, and uh, I wanted to have daily ones as well so in game days uh, they would uh, reset so there'll be like quicker stuff maybe they'll be like oh find me some wood you know and you bring back uh, some wood uh, I am thinking of adding in like an NPC in the hideout that, um, it kind of gives you some of these quests uh, to give you some other stuff to do, and this will give you that repeatability of gameplay later on as well. After you finish the story, you still have more things to do. Now, uh, yeah. can you add unfinished projects as like a little side quest? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by that? So, uh, I one feature I love mission boards when it comes to survival games, but one feature I always get confused on is when I'm like. Wait, I was building this thing. How many supplies did I need and stuff? And I always thought it would be so cool. Survival games were like, all right, you're building a workbench. Here's the supplies you need. Make that a side quest so that I could track it. Oh, like uh, like pinning. Uh, yeah. Um, At the moment, it's, it, it's not a thing because most of the stuff is pretty small, like one or two items. Oh, okay. But it's definitely something uh, that could be done. Uh, I think... Uh, an example is New World um, that has something mm -hmm. like that where you have like recipes for food or like some other stuff and you can pin them and then it shows on on your quest log. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's definitely something needed in a lot of these games. Yeah, because I, I was watching one of your streams when you were building up your base uh, in your server and watching you go, OK, so I'm building these fences and I need a certain amount of barbed wire and you were keeping track on the fly. Man, I can't do that. <laughs> My brain, I'm <laughs> like, wait, was I at 100 or was I at two? I'm going to get 200 just in case. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's, that's awesome. To be honest, most of the time, I, I, I just take more than I need and, and <laughs> hopefully it's enough. Fair, fair. Oh, man, man. So you also developed a weather system as well, didn't you? Um, I'll have to be honest, I did not develop it myself. It is a plugin that you can find on Unreal Engine Marketplace. It's called um, Ultra Dynamic Sky. It's one of the best plug plugins. I have tried like a lot of things from the marketplace, but this one was really good. Um, so it has dynamic weather. Um, it has seasons. Um, you can set um, the location based on coordinates as well. And then it will adjust the sky with the stars and everything according to that location. Um, and you can customize it a lot. Um, for mine, I put it um, on like a bit of a fast track, you know, so it changes the weather faster so I can see it during the environment changes. So I made it, I still needed to do a little bit of work to to integrate it with my terrain, for example, to show the puddles uh, when it rains uh, or show the snow when it rains as well, uh, when it snows. Nice, very nice. Um, I do think that you did uh, actually give us also a uh, video on the, uh, the lighting system and kind of like it changing uh, seasons and stuff, right? Uh, or did yeah, I, I did. understand that. Here we are. Yeah, so this was the, the view um, from the bunker. Um, and it's like changing. And I introduced like the music when it like gets sundown. So 
So I just wanted some music kind of it's like, oh, it's good night time, you know. Um, and you can see like the, the clouds moving there, volumetric clouds. Um, and you can see the time changing in the top right. Um, like in fast mode, <laughs> it would not be <laughs> like this, but it was just kind of like, I was going to go do a toilet break and I'll leave this running on the stream so people can see the weather system and the day night cycle. You can, um, you can see the be right back thing right here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is cool. I mean, you can actually see the clouds moving. I can see the lights um, as uh, well as I can see it from my view right now, kind of going across like the river there starting to come into view a little bit better. The mountaintops are starting to do it. Um, it looks like a nice looking game and this is the uh observatory bunker that you're standing on uh it's the Haida bunker uh the observatory is supposed to be on the opposite mountain that i'm looking at um so oh. the idea is uh when you come out of your bunker you can see your goal uh and you know like that's where i need to go but then like finding your way there is gonna be uh a bit harder <laughs> Nice, nice, nice. And uh, Red, go ahead and do me a favor and pause it when it fully lights up the entire valley down there. Just so people can see just how gorgeous of an attempt uh, this was and the actual game she's developing right now looks. That is really nice looking, right, Yarl? Like, I like that. Part about it, one of the things I was looking at during the night cycle was it was quite cloudy, but there were breaks in the night sky. You could see the stars above, but I was looking at the reflection of the river and I love how the river reflects the clouds. That's one of the when, whenever you are living in the mountains and you look down at a pond, they're almost like little mirrors. And I feel like a lot of games kind of lose that uh, when you're looking at a distance and you can still see the depth of it. But from up here, this is just beautiful how you have the lighting. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, depends, uh, sorry. Um, I am using Lumen, which is global illumination. Uh, so it has reflections real time as well. So everything. Mm -hmm. But that does take a lot of performance. So that's not something for regular computers to run. Um, but it does make it look a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Mwah, but it's not for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, it does look like Iceblade asked a message. He goes, looks amazing. When can I play? <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> whenever it's ready. <laughs> yeah. There's no ETAs. Um, to be honest, oh, uh, when I was working on this, like, most of this, most of the work, on this was done in kind of like four months um but then i stopped working on it and i said uh initially i i wanted by august this year to release a demo but then i i kind of burned out uh a little bit because i could not figure out the animation stuff <laughs> to make it look ah. good um so i took a break from it <laughs> nice nice now what about the animation work bothered you like what made what made you burn out on it uh it's um it's very difficult to make animations from the work uh marketplace fit the character I have. Um for example like holding a gun um like one of the hands would be a little bit off and then when you aim it like goes in a weird direction and it's just like um all of stuff like that like trying to okay. make the animations work on the character it's been very difficult uh you would normally in a real project you would have an animator that has the character in maya or whatever and they make the animations directly for that character and you import them like that in unreal engine so they nice. they fit 100 percent. but i don't have that luxury <laughs> i learned that firsthand when we were working on our senior project and it was just a medieval fighting sim where i had a templar knight fighting uh one of salah men in the middle east and one of the models the swords wouldn't line up right and it just it looked really weird just using generic animations for two different characters and i feel that pain oh man yeah definitely it's 
it's even more difficult because I'm a programmer. You know, I feel like some artists, when they go in Unreal Engine, they have a bit of an easier time with blueprints and, and all that. Um, whereas for me, I'm feeling comfortable in, in the code, you know, typing it out. Mm -hmm. But when I go in blueprints, I feel a little bit lost. Like even doing just simple like mathematic equations and stuff like that. I look at them and I'm like, I don't know where this thing is going. How do I keep track? And then like, if I just type it in C++, you know, and like, oh, yeah, yeah this is nice, <laughs> easy. <laughs> but looking I at blueprints can can mess up my brain. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now. Final question about, well, actually I actually have two final questions about your game. What is the name of your game? Um, I haven't given it a name. I just gave it a project name. Um, so it's called Project Luna. Um, it was just, I, I needed the name. <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm going to have an observatory, you know, stars, stuff, Luna, let's go. <laughs> um, because uh, in terms of like, name for when it comes out it, it can change right like depending on how the story moves on and is written and all that uh so for now it's just like mostly in old old studios the the games have the, like an internal internal name like a project name um yeah so i just give it yeah. a project name and then we'll figure out the name later nice I, I like all of this, and it's really cool. One of the things that I actually enjoyed about this uh, entire process was I actually got to see you on stream work on this game uh, a little bit. I know uh, maybe I didn't get to see all of it, but uh, are there possibly going to be more streams in the future of you actually tackling this when maybe the burnout uh, stuff kind of fades and you want to go at it again? Um, yeah, I think so. Um... When I had my holiday for Christmas last year, for two weeks, I did some day streams um, where I did more um, Unreal Engine streams. And I'm thinking this year as well, when I'm going to have my Christmas holiday, I'll do the same. And I'll try to, to do some more Unreal Engine uh, work on stream. Nice. Very, very nice. Now... Uh, it's really cool hearing about your Unreal experiences, you developing these games and everything else. But you have come back to DayZ and have come back with a veracity in its ambition and excitement for it. And you've launched your own server, uh, Willow Glade, right? Um, yeah, that's correct. I, um, I've been wanting to get back into DayZ for a while. And I kept searching for a server to play on and... We, me and, and, and a friend, we used to go together and then we would find these servers with like tons of, tons of loot and like literally like walk two feet. And then I found like the super sniper, you know, and and I, I didn't like that. Or I would go on a server and uh, uh, I'll find these like monsters, like similar to the one in the picture, like on the coast. And then I would just like not be able to like kill them as a freshie and it was like a frustrating loop of just trying to get my sh my stuff back and um i didn't really enjoy like a lot of servers i found one server i liked like i, I was actually enjoying myself and then we were getting like a space set up and then it closed down Aww. because um the the people were running it they had some some real life issues and they couldn't like afford to run it anymore and neither money-wise or time-wise, so they had to shut it down. Um, yeah. That's, that's when I decided lot. that... Yeah. Um, I decided to maybe give it another go myself. Um, nice. I have a lot of plans for it, uh, but it's just, obviously, it takes a lot of time to get everything implemented, and especially how Daisy is, you know? <laughs> You think that something is going to be easy to implement and then you just find like about 20 problems with it and then trying to find workarounds. Oh man. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, believe it or not, folks, uh, that previous picture of that goat weird thing about it, that's what happens when Jarl has too many drinks. I'm just Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's that's a uh, whiskey, a rum, and unfortunately a gin and tonic. And I hate gin and that's just what it does to me. <laughs> but this 
that was one of the monsters on your server. And then there's this, also this clown thing, which my first experience finding these things, folks, was walking past a soccer field. And I turned them all like, oh, that looks cool. And I kept panning. It was almost like a horror film. As I'm seeing this clown walking around and I see six more of them just spread out on the soccer field. And I'm all like, well, I'm not watching that game. <laughs> and I scurried off. But uh, your server, me, Yarl, Red have played on it quite a bit. And it, it is fun for a PvE server. I really enjoy uh, the survival mechanics. Uh, I think, you know, Jarl, you agree with me, right? The survival mechanics are fun. It's it's fun. I think DayZ is one of those games that gives you the unique perspective of surviving off the land, like primitive survival, making your drill and stick kits, going out and trying to scavenge food, having to grab rocks and starting from the bottom and working your way up. But I've played too many PvE servers where either you could just go buy whatever you want for the cheap at the trader or every building you go into has nine cans of food and there's just no challenge to it whatsoever. Uh, and your server really gave me a run for my money, which I love. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's definitely fun. Like me and Red have been fighting tooth and nail to save them enough money to fight, buy a vehicle because on your server... As far as I know, vehicles don't spawn, so you have to, like, actually save <laughs> enough money to buy them. And it has been tough to do, I will have to say, to save up enough money, because we're still not there yet. But I have never hated trying to um, earn enough money to do it. It's always been, oh, we're only, like, you know, 10,000 more to go. And then, you know, an update happened and we had to save up more money. But, <laughs> you know, it's been fun, like... I put I made I made one of those uh, clown things you folks see on uh, that picture there look like a porcupine with the crossbow bolts. That's hard, how hard one of those things are to take down. It had like six crossbow bolts in its head and it's just all like running after me. I thought I had pinhead running after me. It was crazy. I mean, even the basic infected will give you a run for your money. If you go in there thinking it's just a normal daisy. I've never fired any gun off because I was sworn by basic infected. But the other day when I was playing with Dimension, I just pulled out a little submachine gun I had and I was like, no, go run, save yourself. Da, 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 da. And I've never had to do that before and I love it. Oh man. Yeah, oh. it is tough to balance sometimes these things, you know, between um, veterans and casual people. So mm -hmm. I assume like you guys, you play, but you don't play like 12 hours a day, you know, and um it's been really difficult like the people that play that much they got like stuff er like immediately you know they got the vehicles very fast um which really changes the the gameplay uh so the reason i went for the vehicles only at trailer is because of performance uh reasons i didn't want vehicles on the map spawning because i've had issues with them in the past where they would spawn in a building or in a river or you know like in the weirdest places ever, because the Daisy spawn system is crap, and um, you know it was it was not making it any better um, for the players. So like this, I feel like it kind of sets like a mission goal, you know, that we need to earn money to get a car, and you, it's it's clear that that's what you have to do, because yeah. I know a lot of people struggle with like, okay, I survive, but what is the goal, you know? Uh, so like this you have a goal get a car but getting a car after that it becomes too easy i think so i recently yeah. implemented the a change where radiators and batteries and your wheels um take damage over time as you use them um also whenever you like start the engine your spark plug takes damage um because I had to disable the impact uh, damage, which I wasn't a fan of, but it was, again, one of those daisy things where a lot of people would lag out um, when loading in bases or like the trader, and they would just pan out and, and crash into a rock or a, a pole, and and it's not their fault, you know, and I don't want to um, punish the players for that. Um, whereas adding damage to the parts, it would add more maintenance 
but there still needs to be a bit more adjustments here or there, like in terms of damage, because I've seen some people were saying like, I, I, I used like nine spark plugs in like a couple days, please. <laughs> oh, maybe th maybe that's why I found nine rune spark plugs in a trash stand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh... I, I do appreciate I the agree. removal of the impact damage, though, because I don't know how many... The, the old joke of Daisy is when you're driving a, your car and you hit a styrofoam cup or a garbage bag, and it's just like... <laughs> and I, everybody's dead. Yeah. <laughs> Cars toast. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's uh, still unstable to, to to make use of that. I, I right. wish it wasn't. Like, um, it would it'd be so nice. I, when, when they made the changes to vehicles, I was like, oh, maybe finally? Maybe finally we get, like proper cars you know like yeah, no <laughs> no <laughs> i mean to be fair to the daisy devs they did improve it it's just not there yet <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean I, I even watched one of your streams when you had the new damage systems that you put in you were like you started to drive on a dirt road and you're all like i think my tire was ruined <laughs> And she like, I think you went through like two tires and you're just all like, okay, I think I need to turn it down. It looks like it's a multiplying instead of just adding. Yeah, <laughs> the, the problem was I was trying, I was trying to stop people from driving off road through the middle of the field because turning off the damage encouraged the people of just driving like straight through forests and everything. And it doesn't matter because like, you know, if they bump into something, they don't take damage, right? Whereas before... They were afraid that they would just find the random rock they want to see and that would damage their car but now without damage they don't have that fear anymore so i was like how can i punish the players for going off-road more so i thought i would just check if the terrain is diggable that would mean it's grass right um but that also counted the um the country roads you know the dirt roads oh. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, it counted those as well, and uh, it was giving uh, damage all the time. So I turned that off, but I didn't really tell anyone. So one of the players was like, so for the last couple of days, I kept driving under 20 kilometers an hour just because I was afraid of like taking wheel damage. <laughs> and I was like, good. Bless their soul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I it. I love that system, though, because I'm a big role player when I join these PVE servers, and I love the idea that I don't even have to i don't like buying cars because i think that pretty much just ruins the experience but i can totally buy spark plugs and spare tires and keep them in my inventory and play like a mechanic like hey, hey you need your car fixed bring it on in i got some spark plugs for you and just kind of rope people in to go other places yeah. than just the trader well yeah, yeah i think i think uh as a trader you may be able to buy them but other people have to sell them for the, those car parts mm -hmm. Um, so yep. I didn't, I didn't want to be like, oh, just buy them at the trader. You got to find them more. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's that's one uh, thing I, I really, uh, want to end up where it's more player to player, but there is no trader system that does that with also being able to like, okay, the vehicles are kind of like admin only because it's a, it's a performance thing. Yeah. You know, uh, but like yeah. other items, I want players to play or trading. Um, Trader Plus has a lot of good features, but also uh, it's extremely complex and not everything works as it's supposed to. <laughs> uh, very, very true. Um, well, um, do you have anything you want to uh, say to the community or anything else as we are reaching the time we need to start to wrap up? Uh, this this went by fast. This is... <laughs> Um, I think, uh, you know, if anyone else thinks uh, about going into games, um, just think well about this decision. Um, it can be difficult. It's a, it's a tough industry out there. Um, like, even when I was looking for uh, my next job in, in, the, in the games industry, it took me over six months to find the right job. Um, it, I was probably one of the lucky ones still because there are other people that are looking for many more months um, and there's more and more people coming out of university with degrees and looking for junior roles and there are not many junior roles um, 
So you just gotta prepare yourself if you wanna go into it. And the main things are just create a portfolio. Making mods, it's a very nice, easy way of creating a portfolio. Um, can be in any engine, doesn't matter. Like it will show you have initiative, they have passion and a drive to do stuff outside work as well. Um, and I guess advice uh, for people getting involved in other people's game projects, as I've seen this too often, um, have a strict understanding of your role in the project uh, if you're going to do free work. Because you will put time outside work, probably, um, into this, which might not come out for many years or not at all. So you don't want to like work yourself to the bone, you know, trying to get this game working for someone else because you're putting all this trust in them. Whereas when you work solo, you know, it's your decision if you want to like dump it at some point or want to continue or not. So just be careful out there. <laughs> so that's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear about that because folks, Okiana isn't just somebody who talks to talk. She walks, she has walked the walk and she has done it. She has gone from doing what she did as a financial person to doing modding, to streaming, to making her own game. And now she actually is a game dev. So eat her words that she, she just said well. And uh, this has been wonderful. I've been, I've had so much fun. I wish we had more time to talk with you, Hokiana. Um, Hopefully, maybe one day uh, we'll have you back on. You can tell us more about what you've done with your uh, professional career and even the Project Luma, and even maybe some more of your Daisy modding or other modding ventures. Because I think you just became an ambassador for Ark. But folks, you should keep an eye on her. Uh, don't do um, don't stray away from her. Her link details are below. There's her Discord, her Twitter, her Twitch. Make sure you follow her, and if you like Daisy modding, check out our Steam Workshop. It's right in the description, just down below. Remember, folks, the State of Survival podcast could not be an amazing podcast without Yarl of Goats um, here, Red Falcon, and our other people that help us in the background, like I mentioned. Please make sure you subscribe to them and um, shout them out. Helkiana, thank you very much for being here. I am so happy you, you came on today. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was nice. And ta-ta for now, folks. Bye. Bye-bye.